I think that when I started out in business, uh, I've heard I heard all these things in the personal development space, like oh, you should have you should read these affirmations every morning, blah 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 blah. I never did that, and it was because it felt stupid to me. Now that being said, there might be some people who've had life changing results from doing that. But what I did notice is that the stories I would tell myself about myself were the things that changed my beliefs. They were the things that changed my character. And so a lot of times in some of my other videos, I've talked about how entrepreneurship is about three things. It's about changing the beliefs that you have. It's about increasing the skill set that you have. And then the character traits that go along with that to make sure the skills are successful. So I'll give you a simple example for this. So a friend of mine, he started a fitness app. Um, it was doing about $20,000 a month. He was a top game, uh, CrossFit Games competitor, um, but he was really ashamed because he wasn't the winner. He was like, you know, really, really highly ranked one, but he wasn't the winner. And so he believed that his app wasn't good enough, uh, and so he never promoted it. So it grew to $20,000 a month in revenue with him doing zero promotion, right? And when he realized that it was okay for him to promote it and people got a lot of value from it and the app was good enough, he went from $20,000 a month to like $150,000 a month, like that. And the difference was his beliefs. His skills were the same, right? His character traits are the same, he changed his beliefs, right? So let me give you a different example. So when I actually started out getting in my own business, right, I, uh, I had a chain of gyms. This was a very, very, you know, this was 10 years ago. I had a chain of gyms. I knew how to run sales teams. I knew how to generate leads. I knew how to do all these things. Um, but what ended up happening was I had one missing piece, which was also a belief. Darn, I was actually trying to give you a different one. But I had a mentor come in and say, you need to be, you need to get in the licensing business. You need to license this model to lots of people rather than doing the actual model yourself. And so um, I did make that transition. And then we went from, I think, you know, I think we did like two or $3 million to doing seven. And the next year we did 28 million. So the year that we made the transition halfway through is what jumped us from two or three to seven. And it was just in the last like four months that we saw this crazy growth. And then we did 28 million the next year. And so it was because I had all these skills and I also had the character traits. I just needed again to change the beliefs. I was trying to give you an example with the character traits. I'll, I'll, let me think of one. So if you have, uh, for example, if I had had those skills, but I didn't have the character traits of being disciplined and being focused on one thing, I would have jumped uh, between multiple you know, entrepreneurial endeavors and never been able to see success because even though I had the beliefs about what was possible, um, like if I had said, okay, I'm going to do gyms and I'm going to do chiropractors and I'm going to do dentists, and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, right? Until I had the character trait of focus, the character trait of discipline, um, then I would not have seen the success right? And so the next natural question is, okay, well, if I have to have aligned beliefs, skills, and character traits at each level of the ladder, because you can have, and this is what's crazy. When you see the overnight successes, this is what happens. I want to describe it to you so you understand it and how you can do it. So let's say that there's a ladder, all right? And you've got this pole on one side, you've got the pole on the other side, and you've got the middle bar, okay? You need all three to move to the next level of the ladder, right? And so, for example, you might have the left side built up six stories above where you're at, and you might have uh, the right side build up six stories, you know, uh, or you know, ten stories from where you're at right now. But all of a sudden, if you change your character and that character trait development gives you three more rungs, all of a sudden you go three rungs because you already have the constraint has been removed. And so you can be more advanced in your beliefs than you are in your skills, or you can be more advanced in your character trait than you are in your skills, or you can be more advanced in your skills than you are in your beliefs, right? And so it's having all three of those that are checked off at each level of entrepreneurship that gets you to one one million dollars a year, three million dollars a year, ten million dollars a year, hundred million dollars a year, whatever it is, right? Is you have to have all of them. And so what I the, the point of this video, and I'm gonna is is to get you to understand how to actually develop those soft things because the skills are straightforward, right? The skills are you just go buy the course and you read the book and you consume the content like this and you practice, you apply, right? That's what you have to do. That's it. That's it, right? Um, one of the skills that I see lots of marketers these days not have is they don't know how to sell. They don't know how to develop a sales team. They don't know how to manage and grow a sales team. They don't want to lead a sales team. That's a skill they don't have. And as soon as they do, they go from three million to ten million like that, very very easily, right? It's understanding that that's the skill deficit, and as soon as they do it, boom, they blow up. I was fortunate because I had a ton of the skills in my skill toolbox, but I went from making nothing to tons because I had all of these rungs of this ladder already built out to, to a $30 million level, except I just didn't have the beliefs. That was my issue. Candidly, I suffer from a lot of insecurities, and so my wife was the one who was like, you can do this, like you don't have to have these gyms, like you can license out the model, like you can, you can really succeed like this. And I honestly just thought she was a really smart person and very wise. And so I trusted her belief in me before I really trusted it for myself. And so hopefully you can have somebody like that in your life, but maybe that, that can be me. I trust in your, I trust in your, your skills and your beliefs. So, so hopefully you can borrow some of that trust because I promise you the world does get better when you, when you take those leaps of faith. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation.
Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more, and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Alex Hermosi, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, model wise men. I wanted to give you the simplest single hack that I have used inadvertently and seen a tremendous amount of success. That is asking myself the question, what would a person who does this type of thing do in this instance? The, the one that I'll tell you that I've repeated a lot to myself over the years, probably over the last five or 10 years, has been the repeated chorus of, what would a wise man do? I think it's because I did not consider myself to be very wise and I acted many ways that were unwise um, earlier on in my life and I still continue to do so, um, but I try to do less of it, right? And I think that, and I'll, I'll borrow this again from James Clear's book, your identity is much more of a weighing system. Actually, this is not from his book, but like I th it's much more of a voting system where you, you cast votes in either direction based on your activities of what type of person you want to become. And I think the simplest distillation of that concept is simply asking the question, what would this type of person do? If you can use that as the refrain that you come back to over and over again, the chorus of your day that gets repeated over and over again, I think it's much easier than trying to remember the 50 point checklist of all the activities that you need to do to achieve the goal. And the, the friend that came back in my life um, where we were having this conversation, I just distilled it down to like, what would a billionaire do? And so when we're confronted with these crossroads, right, you wake up in the morning and you're like, I don't know what I should start on. It's like, what would a billionaire do? And so basically what you can do is have a certain refrain or chorus that you ask yourself, what would this type of person do? And that type of person, when you ask that question, is who you will eventually become as you continue to cast votes that reinforce the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are. And those are the things that create long lasting, deep change. And what's more about this is that these changes, when they become internal, when they become ingrained in our behavior, they become effortless, but it takes time. And so I think that the mental cue that I have given myself inadvertently over the years, I don't have a lot of choruses that I refrain to or that I come back to over and over again. And so I tweeted about one and it got shared a zillion times, but so it is, what would someone 10 times smarter than me do in this situation, right? And a different way of saying that is what would a billionaire do? And, and word it in whatever way that resonates with you. But I think rather than having that big checklist, you can put just a little post-it on your computer or wherever you work that's a reminder to yourself that this is the type of person I want to become. And in order to become this type of person, I need to do these things because those actions will reinforce the thoughts that I say about myself. Because the whole concept behind affirmations that I do not like, right, which is I am a, you know, I'm a lion, I'm a tiger, I'm a whatever, right? Just saying them doesn't make them true unless you're a crazy person. And most of us are not crazy, I think, right? There's plenty of crazy, but don't get me wrong, but if you're probably watching this channel, you're probably at least semi-sane, right? If we have, you know, this degree of sanity that's on our side, then what we have to do is create something else which is evidence. We have to give ourselves evidence that we are this type of person in order to become that. But how do you have evidence that you are gonna be this person when you, when you have none? Well, it starts with activity. It starts with doing the stuff. And as an added corollary, depending on the goal that you have, it might be what would a person with a six pack do? What would a pro champion bodybuilder do? What would an amazing husband do? Or what would the best husband in the world do? And so you can use this framework of asking the question of what your ideal self would do in any given circumstance to apply to a vast number of scenarios. So rather than trying to fix for the habit, fix for the being, and then the habits will take care of themselves in accordance with the type of person that you have stated you wish to become. And so then the goals we have become becoming the person we want to be. Once we know who we want to become, then that can direct the types of activities that will be in accordance with that. And the reason I like this better too, is that if we're trying to reinforce an identity or an identity trait about ourselves, this is a really good habit, I think, that I've picked up over the years. Rule number three, stay driven. Recently, I had uh, some of our some of our older OG gym lords who had been a while, you know, I mean, they, 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 they turn their gym around, they've grown, they're at, you know, you know, close to seven figures or right around there. And they've been doing it for a while. And they were complaining about show rates. They're like, hey, our show rates are low. And, um, you know, you go through the sand wall, you're doing the reminders, you're doing all this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 we're doing all this stuff. Okay, cool. And uh, I dig a little bit deeper and I look and it turns out that they're only open one hour per day at 7.15 a.m. for their availability, availability for, for new clients. And I'm like, how the f 
do you think that you're going to grow your business if the only time that you can take new customers is at 7.15 a.m.? In what world does that make sense, right? Like imagine a grocery store that's only open from 7 to, to 7.30 because that's when it's convenient for the owner. What chance do you think that, that that grocery store has at succeeding? Virtually none. And so what happens is people have success. They implement tactics. They use gym watch and then they make money, right? And then what happens? They get comfortable. They get complacent, right? And they lose their hunger. Like after that point, everything, like it's almost like, I almost want to say like after, you, after you've like quote made it in your mind and that's What's funny is that making it in some people's mind is like having 10 grand in their bank account. So like it's scary in terms of what level of making it is. But like once people have made it, I almost want to say like none of these tactics matter because you're just not hungry. Like it doesn't matter. Like the obvious shit you aren't doing. You know what I mean? If your child was going to die or your spouse or your significant other, your family member, whatever it was, was going to die unless you succeeded, unless you got more clients, unless you made more money with your gym, how would you approach it? right? Would you only be available for one hour a day? Would you only be available from 7 to 8 a.m.? Would you only set aside an hour a day to prospect for new customers? Would you only reach out to your existing customers if they hadn't shown up for a month? Sometimes people ask questions that they already know the answer to. It's like, duh, no shit, right? And, and, and it goes back to the, the, the main thing, which is like, what drives you? Right? Like, what drives you? What drives you to be better? What drives you to continue to want to win? I was asked that question yesterday by the, the gym owners that were here. And I think, honestly, it comes from a dark place. And I think I've said this before, but like, I'm saying it again because I think people need to hear it. Sometimes you have to wonder, like, why is it that only when someone else's life is on the line, do you then actually try, right? Like, why is it only then you actually cut all the noise out of your life and then it would go laser focused on actually succeeding? Like, why can't we do that? all the time, right? Like, why can't we do that? Because it's like, well, then I wouldn't be happy, whatever, right? And like whatever happiness means, right? And so the people who are the most successful in the world are driven by something that is deep inside of them that is normally an insecurity or a fear of some sort. If you're only trying to make enough to live on, you will always only make enough to live on. And you will slack the moment you get comfortable and you will wonder, Why is it that as soon as I start making money, I stop? Because you actually don't want to make more. That's why you actually don't want to make more. And so your internal motivation is not not there, like because you've accomplished what you set out to accomplish. The real question is, do you actually want what you claim to want? Do you actually want it? Because if you did, you'd already have it. You'd already, you'd already be willing to sacrifice other things in order to achieve it. And that might mean like maybe waking up earlier, maybe like working four to 8 p.m. to take sales appointments or whatever that thing is. It's just the obvious. Like if you were coaching you, what would you recommend you to do? Right? Like a lot of times if you think about it, like you most of the time know what to do. Like you do on some level, like you probably know that you're like, man, I do stupid sometimes, right? You probably think that on some level sometimes, right? Then you're like, man, if I were, if you could step out of yourself and say, I need to coach myself you probably have the answer. And it's just that you don't do it for some reason. And so all of your attention should be on that reason. Why is it that this thing is preventing me from doing the things that I already know I should do? Rule number four, master labeling. Our minds are meaning making machines. And so what that means is we determine what is meaningful and what is not. And then we ascribe labels to them in terms of positive and negative because that is how we survive. Now, that being said, our brains are meant to keep us alive, not meant to help us thrive, right? To use a rhyming word for you. Now, that being said, with this whole concept around labeling, it's something that I'm probably most passionate about, like the concept of labeling as a whole. It's unbelievably powerful when it comes to persuading people to do things, unbelievably powerful when it comes to changing people's worldviews and their perspectives on life. And I will share a few of those examples with you. So I'll give you a quick persuasion example for how powerful this is. If I wanted to persuade someone to do something, then what I would do is I would create a positive label that I would associate them with. So I would say, you are probably a loving and caring man for or, you know, you want to provide support for your family. Is that true? They're like, yes. And I'm like, yeah, you definitely seem like one of those types of people. And since you are one of those types of people, I think that you should invest in this program that we have because that would be in alignment with this ideal. 
that we just labeled the person with. And so what happens is it creates cognitive dissonance because for the person, in order for them to stay in accordance with the label that they would like to have, they then feel obligated to then act in accordance with that label that we just uh, prescribed. Now, that's a very simplistic example. You can weave that into narratives and sales scripts so that people become psychologically labeled and then want to act in accordance with that label because they see it as positive, right? The thing is, is that it can also work in reverse in terms of how you can harm someone. And the reason that this is so viscerally upsetting to me is that I have had members of my family extended and whatnot who have, I would say, debilitated themselves in large part because of what they believe to be mental illness, and I disagree. Now, many people will get triggered at this, and so I will say my big disclaimer, which is this is not financial advice, this is not grammatical advice, this is not spiritual advice, this is not even advice. This is a guy making a YouTube video about stuff that pisses me off, and hopefully some of the things that serve me well. Now, let's talk about the labels that are negative. One of the things, one of the most pernicious acts that exists, negative, bad stuff, is when we take the human experience that has ups and downs, that has extremes, that exists on continuums, and we label one side of the continuum as bad and the other side of the continuum as good. For example, happy, sad, energized, or weak, tired, right? We have equal opposites, uh, you know, relaxed, stressed, right? There's lots of examples of these. The reason that this is so dangerous when we give a positive or negative label is that people think that they have a problem when they are not feeling happy or energized or relaxed or clear-minded versus foggy, you know what I mean, whatever. And the thing is, is in order for there to be light, there must be darkness. Think about that for a second. In order for there to be good, there must also be bad. One, if you want to admit the existence of one, there must also be the existence of the other. Right, awesome. Now, the problem, this is why we have to be careful with labels, that most people suffer from is that they label normal variations in the human condition with negative experiences. And so they see themselves as tired and say, this is bad. Whereas it's really just part of the human condition. They see themselves as sad rather than happy and see that as bad. And so what happens is you start to upgrade a finite emotional condition into a long-standing emotional disturbance because you think it's a problem. And the thing is, is it's very easy to sell people on why these things are, are problems. Big Pharma is, is the king of this. Are you feeling tired, stressed? You know, are you hungry? Are you horny? Well, you are suffering from being a human being. It's being human. And so I think a lot of this, and the reason that it wraps into the original part of the prompt of this video, is that if we want to be enduring entrepreneurs, we want to be people who have resilience, we want to be people who have mental fortitude, we must be careful about the things that we label. And there's also the good bad label, which is the simplest label that a lot of people ascribe to conditions that are that are uh, ephemeral, right? They're, they're brief, right? And then they change. But there's also the shoulds, have, musts, need to, et cetera, that we say in our lives that we have to do these things, or we must do these things. And if we do not, or else, we put out a threat towards the universe. If I don't get my coffee, I must get my coffee, I need to have coffee before I start my day. What happens is that we create these implied threats to ourselves in the universe. If we don't, then what? Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business I'll see you there rule number five act first one of the things that I've seen across the board when we're talking to entrepreneurs and you know the, the gym owner community that we have is that the one trait I see over and over again that is clear to the people who are are winners right the top one percent I'm not talking top ten percent but the top one percent is the speed with which they execute after making a decision. One of the definitions that like we talk about in the community is that the definition of power, as I understand it, is the gap between thoughts becoming reality. And so if you thought about an omnipotent being, right, something, someone who has unlimited power, as they think that thing would be, right? And so if you were to believe in a creator of some sort, then you might think, 
as that creator thought the universe became, right? And so if you think that as like the ultimate scale of power, then the closer we can get to that, the more powerful we become, the more potent we are as entrepreneurs. And so I see this so many times that it's, it's, it's not even, a, it's not even a, oh, like this is associated with success. Like this is what creates success because the gap between where you decide something is a good idea and when it actually occurs is the loop with which you can improve your business. And so it's a lot like, I can't remember what the saying was, but it's, it's not like how old the car is, but about how many miles are on it. And what I mean by that is like, we're young, right? But there's been a lot of, a lot of iterations that have happened from, you know, when the business first started, when I started my first gym until now. And I think the key to that is the speed of the OODA loop. And that's, that's just like a military term, like observe, orient, decide, act. And it's just the loop with which that you can basically see what's going on, make a decision, act on it, and then do that whole loop again, right? Because the faster you can pivot and iterate, the more responsive you are as an entrepreneur, the faster you can take advantage of opportunities, the faster you can find out what failures are, and then move on. I want to talk about this within the context of running a team and employees, and then also within yourself. And so from running your team, right? One of the things that, you know, once, once you're moving out of you doing things all the time, there's how do I get other people to do things? And so that's why I called this like of week, right? Is that I, one of the things, one of my biggest pet peeves is like, yeah, I can get you that by, by end of week. I'm like, why don't you just get it to me in an hour? Because that's how long it takes. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's like, well, well, I have a meeting right then. It's like, is it more important than this? No. Okay. Well then do it. Like if you think about how you can run an organization like that, if you can get things done end of day, right? Rather than end of week, you are literally speeding up the organization seven X. Think about that. And so when you're thinking about deadlines and you're thinking about expectations, you as the owner can set the, you set the cadence. If people say, Hey, can we do this? And then you're like, cool, let's start right now. You set the tone for how the organization is going to move, how quickly it's going to orient, how quickly thoughts become reality and ultimately how powerful the organization will become because of the speed, right? And speed isn't doing things fast. It's basically just not being distracted by other it doesn't matter. It's being able to prioritize. And most people, a lot of the times, aren't doing something that's high priority, right? A lot of times they're just doing nothing. If you can speed up that loop and force and, and put apply pressure to your team to not do things by end of week or even end of day, it's like, it's 10 a.m. Can you get this done by noon? Uh, okay. And then you can have that loop happen three times within a day rather than it taking three weeks, right? Because you've set that cadence from the beginning and then things get done faster. So I've been reading some really interesting books lately and I, and I referred them out to um, a handful of entrepreneur friends that I have that are all doing five, five to 15 million, kind of in that range. And what was amazing to me is that every single one of them read the book immediately, sent me back their notes and what they were going to do with it. And at, like, and basically were asking feedback on, on the angle that they were going to take with it. What's fascinating to me is that if you look at if you look at lower level entrepreneurs, they, and I'm not saying that in a negative way, I'm just saying in terms of just objective revenue, like just they haven't achieved as much. The delay between being able to gain information and act is so much longer. And that's why they are where they want to be. It's kind of the same degree of people who are like, who pay for our program and haven't gone through the portal yet. I'm like, what do you do? Right? Like what priority, like what, what education do you have that is not relevant to your business? Like you're reading a, a motivational blog right now when you have to translate that motivation into a thought that you're then going to quote test and then you have to see how that test works and then maybe it improves something rather than just following the playbook that has already been tested and has already like the, the tree has been shook. Right. And so if you look at like Joey, for example, who by, by all definitions, his gym is the, is the number one gym within gym launch, right? He had already finished everything in legacy by week eight, his first eight weeks, he'd already implemented every single system in legacy. And so it's not like, it's not like he has more hours in the day, right? It's not like his business is different. It's just that his level of efficacy in execution was so high because he didn't allow himself to get distracted by things. And the moment he has something he needs to execute, it creates this itch inside of him that he cannot, he can't move forward without executing this so that the relief comes. And if you can start to foster that type of behavior in yourself and those attitudes about execution, you will grow faster and you will become more powerful as an entrepreneur, right? If you think about your competition, who would you fear, right? The competitor who sees what you're doing, 
can immediately execute, implement, and improve on it at a faster loop than you can even understand what's going on, right? And that's where speed of first to market and things like that don't matter as much because if an ex, if, a, if a competitor can execute an out OODA loop, right, can can speed that loop up faster, they can iterate, improve on it faster than you can, and then you have no chance to catch up. And so if you're looking at your business, look at it from a context of speed of how long does it take us to improve things? How long from understanding that our churn is high to executing the five horsemen, how long did that take? We knew what the problem was. How long did it take for us to do? And if you can, if you can, if you can get real with yourself about how many actual hours it will take to do something, and then you look at your week and you think, okay, what am I doing today that is more important than this? And where can I put these two hours? And start with the moment that you make the decision. And then all of a sudden you'll be getting things done that day that afternoon rather than end of week, end of month. We purposely delay these things because we just procrastinate for no reason when the the problem will not go away, right? And so that is why within Gym Launch, speed is king is one of the core tenets of the business because you have to, and, and the tone has to start with you as the entrepreneur. Like you have to apply that pressure. You have to say end of week. Why, like what, what are you doing today that's more important than this, right? What are you doing in the next two hours that's more important than this? Tell me. Right. And a lot of times we'll get the answer like, well, I guess I can do it now. It's like, yeah, then let's do it now. Let's get it done. Right. And that small change can 7x. Right. If you even going from end of week to end of day can 7x how quickly your business grows because the solutions that you need to implement to solve the problems and break through the bottlenecks happen today, not in a week not in a month. And then the reaction to the next thing that breaks, the next bottleneck in the business happens not in a week, not in a month, but in a day. And then that's how quickly you can pivot from where you are to where you want to go, because it's not one big thing. It's a million small turns that will get you there. Rule number six, find a mentor. You need someone who you can trust. Like if you're giving someone your money, like, or you're trying to take someone's advice or counsel, you need to trust their intentions. All right. And so it's not just whether they have integrity, it's whether they have your best interest in mind. All right. So I'm going to get to how I solve for that in a second. But that is the first character trait of you need that you need of a counsel of somebody of any kind of counsel, really, whether it's investment law, etc. The second um, is efficacy or their skill set. Right. So let's think of both. Let's think of dis- different scenarios here. So let's say you might trust your mom implicitly, but she doesn't have the skill of knowing much about, you know, how to structure insurance policies or trusts or, you know, investments in tech startups, right? She might not know have that skill, but you might trust her intention, right? For you specifically. On the reverse of that, you might see that there's this person who's got lots of skill, is prodigious in this, but it also means that they know exactly how to screw you if they want to, right? Which is one of the double-sided things of being really good at something, right? You know all the details, you know how to write the agreement, structure the deals in order to make sure that you, you know, get the best outcome, right? And so the idea is to find someone who has both your best interest at heart and has the ability to deliver on what you want. Right. And so it's both of these things. And so you're like, well, yeah, maybe that seems obvious for me. Just even boiling it down to that was very helpful for me because when I look and I look through advisors, look for people I want to get counsel from, I have to look at these two things. All right. So here's how I test for the integrity piece. And here's how you can kind of like you can uh, control for risk here. Right. One is I always try and interview as many advisors as humanly possible. All right. Um, And I do that because I'm going to get as much information from each of the counsel during this process that will give me perspective from which to make a judgment. Right. One of the biggest problems with this, like if you think about Julie, who's trying to lose weight, right? She goes to the gym and then she talks to this 10 personal trainers. One personal trainer says, it's all about high fat, low carb. Another guy says, Hey, don't worry about that keto stuff. It's all about high carb, low fat. And then another guy says, no, you really just need a balanced thing. And then another guy says, it's only about calories. It's only about counting your macros. And so you get this huge perspective perspective so that hopefully you can make a judgment call. Otherwise, when you talk to the first guy and he says, it's all about keto, then you're like, well, I guess this is it, right? I guess these guys all have opinions when in reality, there is a truth. You just don't have the perspective from which to make a judgment yet. And so the first step in this is that I interview as many as as I possibly can from reputable sources. So this is where I reach out to my network. I make posts, et cetera, to try and get as many referrals as I can. All right. So that's step one. Step two for the integrity piece is that I try and have aligned incentives. Now, a lot of times there are incentive systems that appear aligned, but not are not in reality. So let me give you an example. So in the real estate market, if you're a realtor, for example, you may think, oh, this realtor has my best interest at heart, right? Because they have an incentive to sell the house. And so that is why they're going to get compensated. So they want to sell it for as much as possible. Ah, but they aren't incentivized to sell it for as much as possible. They're incentivized to sell it as fast as possible and get the deal closed, all right? And so think about this. For you, selling a house for $500,000, that's worth $500,000, 
is a normal, you know, that like that's normal. That's the market price, right? But for you to make an extra, let's say $25,000 or $50,000 would be really material. That would be a huge extra outcome for you. You would probably push a lot harder to get the extra $25,000 or $50,000. Now, let's say that um, you could probably sell it in a day at $450,000 because it's below the market value of the house, right? Now, here's what's crazy is that if a, a selling realtor you know, like total, it might be 7%, 2% goes to the buyer and, and 5% goes to the seller. If 5% is going to your realtor, 5% of $500,000, right, is 25 grand, okay? And so for them, the, the $50,000 decrease to drop you from 500 to 450 means that they're going to give up $2,500. So they're gonna make 22,500. So let me ask you a question. Now in the reverse, if they sell for 525, they're gonna get 27,500, right? And so it's a $5,000 swing off of a you know, $25,000 nut for them. And one of them might take them three months and one of them might take them a day. So what is their incentive? Their incentive is to, get the, is, to, is to make as much money as possible per unit of time. And so they're incentivized to sell as fast as possible. And so this is one of those things where you have to put your thinking cap on and say, are our incentives truly aligned? And so when we're looking at this, when I say there's two aspects that I look for counsel or somebody who's gonna help me do something financially, legally, insurance wise, whatever it is. So first is that integrity piece and are their incentives aligned? The incentives being aligned and you could restructure that deal and say, hey, you know what, you're gonna get 0% on anything below $400,000. I'll give you 3% on anything between 400 and 450. And then from 450 and up, I'll give you 20%, right? Or 15% or whatever, right? And so now they're highly incentivized to push and now your incentives are aligned because each increment for you is worth almost as much as it is to them. And that is how you would align incentives, all right? Now, how do you test for the second thing, which is their skill set? This one's hard, all right? Especially if you don't have the perspective from which to make a judgment, which when I enter new things, when I'm trying to learn about trust, and I'm trying to learn about investment things and different vehicles, I'm learning about storage units, I'm learning about multi, like you're like, oh man, there's so much stuff and there's so much nuance that you have to have, right? And so the first thing is, I like to usually read two to three books on the topic, all right? And I read two to three books just so I don't appear like an idiot. Um, and so I can at least understand what they're saying and they're gonna respect you to, they will, it's kind of like defense. If you bring your, if you bring at least some level of knowledge, they don't feel like they're gonna take advantage of you. So so this is, this is a first thing that I do, and this is because I don't like feeling exposed in these types of conversations. The second thing you can do is if you have someone that you can trust, you can bring them in alongside you. And the third thing that you can do, which is probably the, the most and highest recommended, is repeating the same action I said in the first hand, which is try and talk as to as many of them as possible, and then you will gather the insights, and you'll see the people who demonstrate the most expertise. And what you can do is take what one person says and say, well, what about this? And see what they reply with. Right, and as you gain more and more knowledge, and this is how you, so in the consulting world, this is qualitative research, right? This is where you're literally doing interviews, essentially, to gather information so that you can make an informed decision, right? And so when you do these interviews, and this is what, this is the lazy part, this is what most people don't do, is they won't do this work, right? They won't take the time to interview 20 people or 10 people, when in reality, these one decisions, the guy who you decide to you know, invest in, in their fund, or if you decide to buy this building or, or invest in a fund that, that buys X, Y, and Z, right? Or, you'd, or you have somebody who, who manages your portfolio, whatever it is, right? That one decision can be one of the most, if not the biggest influence on your total net worth over a long period of time. And people take more time to figure out what they wanna, where they want to go on vacation than where they're going to put their money. Right, and so my ask to you is that if you if you put these put these lenses on, think about both of these lenses. Lens one: Do I think this person is integrous? Do I think this person has my best interest at heart? And then two: Do they have the skill to deliver on that promise? Because I don't want my mom doing my investments. I know she has my best at heart, but she has no idea what she's doing. And then I don't want somebody who absolutely knows what they're doing and does not have my best interest at heart. Right? Which honestly, unfortunately, is a lot more of the cases that that you'll come up with. And candidly. You know, a lot of times they're literally incentivized against you. You know, uh, in, in the insurance industry, they're, they're kind of incentivized to rip you off. It's, it's, it's pretty terrible. And there's a lot of industries like that. Mortgage brokers are incentivized to rip you off. And so you really have to look at it from both lenses. And these types of decisions can make the biggest impact on your net worth and your financial future simply based on who you decide to work with. Rule number seven, recognize talents. When I started in this business, I took every single sale and it was because I was so afraid that somebody would waste the opportunity. So if you have that fear, I understand where you're coming from. Second, when I had my first sale that was not me, I, I just had this emotional breakdown because I was like, oh my God, this could actually happen. And I promise you, if you haven't had it happen yet, you will when it does because you realize that this business can actually work without you and other people can make it rain too, right? And then I'll tell you a quick story that, that illustrate the next point that I'm going to make. So 
as I, you know, hired some salespeople. Now, the, that first salesperson, were they exceptional? No, but they were able to get the job done. Later on, I had my first kind of like killer. Um, and his name was Mauro Negretti. And he, uh, he came in, I don't know, a year or two into the business, a year into the business. And he so quickly was able to assume the sales role. And to, to show you how laughable this is, he started and I was about to start training him and some lady walked in the door and I was like, hey man, like I can take, he's like, no, I'm good. He's like, go do your thing. He's like, finish your session accountability. I'll get, I'll figure it out. And he ended up closing this first lady who walked in the door for a paid in full. And I remember walking in like completely dumbstruck. I was like, he didn't even know what the pitch was. But she walked out giggling, happy, so excited to start. And what that moment taught me was that it is good to train salespeople, but it's better to take great salespeople and then just point them in a direction. And so this has informed a lot of the thinking that I have around talent in general. And I'll tell you a couple of frameworks that have informed this. But like, if you look at Harvard, Harvard doesn't produce the smartest people. They select the smartest people and then they put smart uh, professors in front of them. But like the base level of intelligence of everyone who's at Harvard is already exceptionally high. And so like, even if the teachers at Harvard were not exceptional, the students are, and they would be successful independent of that because their selection is so ridiculous, right? And so if we can think about our own companies that way, and especially if you're in the service business, like look at the biggest service companies out there. Like look at McKinsey, look at Bain, look at BCG, look at basically a lot of the finance world is are, are service-based businesses a lot of times, right? And they're able to do that because they create such a pool to select from that they are able to skim for the best talent, right? I heard this uh, quote from... Uh, Esther Cathy, who's the founder of Chick-fil-A, you win the championship in the draft. And so it was such a belief that they had about picking the right people even more so than training. And I would say that I have moved in that direction of a little bit more nature than nurture when it comes to roles, specifically sales, especially. There are certain characteristics about building rapport, about having certain, you know, dynamics or energy, whatever you want to say, that like Mario Negretti, when he walked in, he had all of these things and he didn't even know the pitch, but he won that sale off of just pure rapport. And so if I'm going to allocate the same level of time to training somebody, I might as well start with somebody who has a much higher base because I could spend 10 hours to take someone from a two to a four and a half, or I could spend the same 10 hours taking someone from a six to a nine. And the thing is, I'm also gonna get more bang for my buck in terms of my hours of training with somebody who has nat a natural proclivity for selling compared to somebody who does not. What's interesting about this, and this is just like my observation, is that you just have to be willing to talk to more people in the uh, recruiting process. I will say like, from a recruiting standpoint, there's there's two kind of things to look out for. If you're, if you're, if you cannot pay super handsomely based on your price points, which you need to maybe fix later. But like, if you can't pay super well for the salesperson, then you need to look harder and you'll need to interview more people and you'll need to probably run ads and use your network. If you can pay well, the best salespeople are already employed. And so it comes down to recruiting those salespeople from other sales jobs, ideally from companies just like yours, so that they already know a lot of the things coming into it. So it decreases the ramp up time for them because all we're really doing is swapping products and the actual sales cycle, the type of sale, is it a transactional sale, is it a long sale, is it a software sale, is it a coaching program sale, whatever it is, right? There's so few variables that we're changing that they can immediately jump and go, which also allows you to make a judgment on their proficiency faster. And so as a quick side note to this, because this is something that I've given a lot of thought, if you look at the top salespeople and sales trainers, and this is gonna drive, point, drive home the point that I was making earlier about it being, much of it being born, all right, is that, if you look at the top people who are in the space, you look at Jordan Belfort, right? You look at Bradley, you look at, um, and some people would, would, would say me in terms from a selling perspective, all the guys that I know who have taught sales were exceptional salespeople day one. Bradley started selling cars when he was 18 years old and was the top salesman at 18 years old when he started. And he was like, I just found something I was really good at. Jordan Belfort talks about how he didn't know how to train anybody in his book. And then all of a sudden he, for the first time ever, wrote out a framework to explain the straight line sales system, which became his book and all that kind of stuff. But he, up to that point, it was just what he naturally did, right? And I can tell you in my instance as well, I'd already closed thousands of deals before I even consumed my first sales training. And so like, I do think that if we are selecting salespeople 
I think it's much more about selection than it is about training. The training is to remind them how good they are, not necessarily to make them good. All right, and this is something that has shifted over time for me specifically. Now, if you're like, well, I suck at sales, you can absolutely put way more time into yourself than a business would reasonably put into an employee. All right, like you have you all the time. So you can train you in all your off hours and you're spending your own time to invest in yourself. But from a return on investment perspective, it's the cost of finding a good salesperson compared to the cost of training a bad or mediocre salesperson is significantly lower. It's much easier to find the right people than it is to take somebody and then make such a crazy extensive training unless your entire model is, we just take on every single person who walks in the door, like 24 Hour Fitness has this model. They take on anybody who has a pulse and then they put them through a ridiculous culling process and then 10% of people make it in the first 90 days. Rule number eight, manage your attention. A lot of people, I would say, mistakenly think that the number one resource is time, right? Everyone's like, time is money, time is money, time is money. And I would argue that that's not necessarily true. I would argue that attention is money. That is the golden resource. So the billionaire friend that I have, he's actually uh, been helping me on um, the new endeavor that we are launching to our gym lords uh, soon, which I think will change the industry. Anyways, he's been helping me with that stuff. But like, here's an example. On his phone, his phone does not ring unless you are already a contact that has been whitelisted. His phone doesn't ring. It's, he is impossible to reach. The more successful, the, more th the, the, the larger your company grows, the more you scale, the more you need to scale. And the only way to scale you is because you do have a finite amount of attention. And so what happens is you have to decrease all of the other things in your life that drain attention because you can have as much time as you want, but if you're not there, you're not potent, you're not able, then you can't get anything done with that time that you're supposedly allocating, which is why a lot of people end up in this in-between state of always everywhere and at the same time nowhere, right? And so they're, they're everywhere, but they're not paying attention to anything. And, that's, and the reason that it's difficult to focus is because entrepreneurs, the character trait that made us into entrepreneurs is that we're go-getters, we're, we're risk-averse, we're creators, we're innovators, we're builders, right? We have all of those traits. But the difficulty is, is that the thing that gets you from zero to one is not the thing that gets you from one to two, right? And so one of the, the reason that you have to totally morph and why you have to be a growth-oriented individual is because you have to change your own individual character traits in order to progress as a business owner. And so, like I said, the things that got you here are not the things that are going to get you there. The things that got you here, which is your own internal skills, are not the things that you need to pass on to other people. So the only way that you are able to grow your business at a certain point is by growing other people, right? And the only way you can do that is if you have the attention and the bandwidth in order to do so. And that's why if you look at a business owner and like the more I obsess on looking at billionaires and people who are, who are doing better than we are is I look at how quiet and how clean they keep their space. And I mean that both, both in a literal sense that like their surroundings, their office, their house, their homes, their cell phone, their computers, right? They're, it's, it's, it's quiet, right? Everything, like it's, it's pristine. And when you talk to these people, there's a certain amount of, of tranquility that's there. And, and they, just, they just have very low tolerance. And it's not that they're trying to be impatient with you or impatient with the world. It's just that they understand that they have so like they're, they're operating at such a high level that there's so many things that are demanding of their time and attention that they just like they can't. And so they have to forcibly remove themselves from so many different situations. And I'm going to give you an example. So one of the people that I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat mentoring, right? They had, they had four businesses and this is something that, that happens so many times. It lit, like, like you want, you want a hundred thousand dollar coaching. This is what happens in hundred thousand dollar coaching sessions. And I'm being honest with you. What happens is someone who's coming in, usually doing between one and $3 million a year, um, can't get past a certain point. Right. And the reason they can't get past is because they only have so much attention and they've spread between four or five different cakes. That's when the gym owner has four gyms and is making less money than they did when they had one gym because the amount of attention that they can allocate to one facility has gone down so much that with fixed costs, they basically are breaking even, right? And so the same thing happens. Now that entrepreneur is probably making one to $3 million in gross revenue, but not taking anything home because they don't have the attention to actually put onto things. And so in order to grow, you need to do less. In order to grow, you need to do less. And that comes from both delegation and also choosing what not to do. The better you get, the better the opportunities that you have to say no to. Imagine the level of opportunities that we have now. I'm just being honest. So imagine 
how many things we could do or try and JV with or do a partnership with or whatever because of the distribution network that we have and the trust and the goodwill that we have with the gym owners um, that we have in our network, right? A lot. I get, I, you know how many people cold message me? Like, I have an opportunity for you. I'm like, really? You have an opportunity for me. And so the better you get, the better your opportunities you have to say no to, which is why becoming a higher and higher and higher level entrepreneur is more and more difficult because it requires discipline. It's not about doing more. It's about doing less because we innately want to do more. So doing more of your own internal characteristic, if that was what it took to get to be more successful then everyone would be more successful because it would be something that does not take effort because that is something that we already do. It's like, man, I outwork anyone. I've got all this work with it. Cool. That gets you from zero to one. It's not going to get you any further than that. So stop identifying with that. It was something that I used to identify with. I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll outwork anyone. I'll, blah, 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 whatever. Like That was something that I used to think about. And it was a character trait. It was an identity thing. And the more you grow, the more you realize that your identity needs to be fluid. Because what it needs to be is exactly what it needs to be at that given time of development. Because the character traits that I'm going to have to emphasize in a year are going to be different than the ones that I have to emphasize now. The skills that you need to learn, like delegation, leadership. Those are things that are not the things that take you in the beginning. You have to be independent. You have to be uh, hustling. You have to be grinding. You have to be willing to put in the work because no one else will do it for you, especially if you have no capital to start, which most of the people who are on here are in that situation. To reel this back in, the number one thing that you have to be paying attention to is where you are paying your attention, right? Like you spend attention. That's why they call it paying attention. It's because it is a resource. And most people don't pay attention to that, right? And so one of the things that a lot of people don't know about me, this one's going to go long. Um, <laughs> what a lot of the, some of the things that a lot of people don't know about me is that I, for nine months, paid a coach to teach me one thing, which was to manage my attention, it was to teach me how to think. And so for 90 minutes, every single day, all I did was talk about what I was thinking about. Think about that. Every day, I paid attention to where my attention was. And when I did that, all of a sudden, my business blew up, right? And I realized that I had toxic relationships. I had toxic relationships with parents. I had toxic relationships with friends or pseudo friends, things that, I, that were taking my attention, past things that I had on my mind that I knew I had not handled. So those are called like open loops or open cycles, right? So when you have something that you're like, I haven't resolved this then you need to handle that and you'll get that attention back because what happens is you have this bowl, this tiny little bowl of marbles and each of those marbles is a a unit of attention, right? If you had to measure it. And so you put little marbles of attention on your childhood traumas. You put little marbles of attention on your marriage. You put little uh, marbles of attention on your health. You put little marbles of attention on your spirituality and then massive marbles of attention on your business. But the thing is, is that sometimes you need to quiet and collect all of these other little marbles so that you have more potency, more potential energy, more potential units of attention to spend on the one thing that you're trying to grow, which in this case would be your business. And what's interesting is that what happens is that things that were perceived as difficult become really easy. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but like if you were in college or you were in high school and you were like, man, I can't solve this problem, this math problem, and you were exhausted, and then you go to bed, and then you wake up the next morning, And then all of a sudden it seems really easy. You're like, I don't know why I didn't see that before. Because attention gives you the ability to see, right? Like if if you think about wisdom, right? Wisdom is an ability to see what other people cannot see, right? Two people are presented in the same situation. The wiser person sees things that the other person doesn't. And how can you see better? You see better if you have more ability to see, which comes from your most valuable resource, attention. How much horsepower do you have? And so look at the things that you have in your, in your life right now. Like if I see someone who has a messy relationship life, who's got a messy love life, who goes out every weekend and gets trashed, right? Like I can tell you billionaires don't do that. That like the whole Tony Stark, like vision of the entrepreneur is a farce. It's not true. Don't believe that. Every single billionaire, every single high level entrepreneur is quiet, unbelievably quiet. They keep themselves completely isolated. They have a bubble around them of, of layers of protection. They're like, like for me, it's, it's me and then there's Layla and then we have our COO and then we have our executive assistant team because we have a team of EAs at this point. We have four um, who work the next level. There's no one who has direct access to me, including our employees. No one does. And that's because it's, it would disserve you, you guys, our gym owners, 
if everyone had access to me. The reason that I don't respond to Facebook messages is not because I don't want to. It's because I literally can't. And if I did, I would be disturbing everyone because then my attention would be split because someone can't generate leads in their market or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, because these little things, these little things that are perceived as huge issues to you in that moment, because you have a little bit of attention, you, you have so little left that everything seems like an explosion. But when you have lots of capacity, big problems seem small and small problems seem big. And it sounds reverse because what you do is you start seeing that all of these things are attention drains and you just say, I don't want to play anymore. And you stop playing. Rule number nine, discover what people want. Most business strategies are not complicated. Find something that something find something people want, charge a lot of money for it, and deliver that thing really well, so much so that they tell other people about your product. It's not overwhelmingly complex to consider. The execution is difficult, but the concept is not. And so a lot of people think they're going to win on strategy when they're starting a business, when you could have two people who have lawn care companies and one person has a lawn care company worth a billion dollars and one person that can barely break $5,000 a month, it's not because the strategy is significantly different, it's just the execution. How is it that an entrepreneur or two entrepreneurs can start at the exact same time and one can get 10, 20, 30 times faster, or when you start over again, you can always skip these steps to get to your level of incompetence. My theory around this comes down to pattern recognition. And let me explain. It's not just pattern recognition from the perspective that you have strategies or something that you're, you're, you're recognizing, but actually patterns in people. And so I'm gonna give this a quick story to drive this, this point home. I have struggled for the last decade to find uh, an assistant. And so it's one of the things I'm actually, you know, a little embarrassed about, but I, I've i gone 0 for 7 on assistance. Um, so much so to the point that I was just, I almost kind of gave up just even trying to find an assistant. And until recently, I, every time I had an assistant, it just always right off the bat, it just never felt like right. And I always was like, yeah, maybe it'll get better. It'll get better. And it, and it just never really did. And the problem was that I didn't know what it looks like when it's right. And so in the videos that I talk about, I use the word, the, the term ideal scene. I don't know what the ideal scene of this dynamic looks like when we are scaling companies, right? And I'll, and I'll tell you what, what I found out there in a second, but like when we're scaling companies, what we have to do is pay down ignorance tax of knowing what ideal scene looks like, which is where speed comes from having people who have outside eyes look in who already do know what ideal, ideal scene looks like so you can skip steps faster. And so I'll give you an example of what this looks like in real life. Like for me, in the role of executive assistant, thank God that like for me, it wasn't a necessary thing to continue to grow the businesses. Now that I have one, I don't ever really want to live life without that one. But the entire time I kept bringing people in. I didn't know what to look for. We do hiring, you know, we do a hiring process. We do an onboarding and training process. They never really got up to speed or we never really got in sync. And then I'd slowly kind of fall away. There would be distance and then it became kind of awkward. And then I would end up having to cut the relationship. And so in this instance, we immediately synced up. I really like the person. I trust the person and they are so proactive in all aspects of my life that I just sit down and start working. And then she places things in front of me. I'm like, Hey, I got 13 minutes. She's like, cool, do this. I'm like, oh, I've got, you know, 18 minutes here. She's like, cool, do this and do this. And every time I'm done, I'm like, hey, what else should I do? And she's like, boom. And so we meet based on the priorities that I have. And then she has this big stack and knows how long every, every one of these things takes because I talked to her about how long I think the task will take. And then as I have openings, we slot it in. So it's like I wake up and I'm just crushing work until the end of the day because I know that the amount of time that's been allotted for each of the tasks is the appropriate amount of time. And so, and if I do finish early, I get another task done, right? And so we can, we can, we can crush stuff. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is don't let fears stop you. Me quitting my job was the single hardest decision that I've ever made in my entire life. And I mean that genuinely. It was the hardest decision that I've made. It took me six months to do it. And I listened to Arnold's Rules of Success speech every morning when I wake up about, you know, it's okay to fail. And I had to keep saying this stuff because I was so outwardly driven, I was so status driven that I didn't want to take the risk of being seen as a failure. And so it only was when I was literally confronted with my own you know, the fact that I was really not even willing to be alive anymore is one that was kind of my jogging to awakenness moment where I was like, you know what, if I don't even want to be alive anymore, then what's worse than that?
And so that was what ultimately shot me on the trajectory to you know, quit that job, sell the condo, put everything that I had in my car, and I drove across the country in 36 hours to California, which is where I thought the land of fitness opportunity would be. Now, mind you, I was a, a management consultant. We did space, cyber, and intelligence for the military um, at a subcontractor at Booz Allen, if you're familiar with that consulting firm. And that's what I did for two years, and it sounds really you know, cool and sexy, but it was not at all for me, and I really did not enjoy it. But I learned some valuable lessons, like how to learn while I was there. And so I think that what most people, you know, it really depends on who you are and understanding your skill set and honestly and how much pain you're in. And so there's also different ways to satisfy that pain. I think true to my core, if I had been in a different company or I was working on different projects at that time in my life, I probably would have never quit. It was so hard for me. And I didn't have a wife, I didn't have kids, I had zero dependents and I lived on nothing. And it was still one of the hardest decisions of my life because I'm very risk averse. So believe it or not, most entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of people talk about how they, you know, they didn't do well in school and, you know, teachers never understood them and they always knew they had to go out on their own. I never had any of that. I worked really hard in school, I did really well in school. The teachers liked me for the most part. And you know, I, I got a good job afterwards. And so I did not have the traditional entrepreneur journey. Um, and it was only because I was so sad, deeply depressed in that time in my life and felt so empty that I actually made the jump. And so I think the first thing is like, one, are you, are you incredibly sad? <laughs> are you incredibly dissatisfied with your life? So much so that you'd be willing to uproot and change. Number one. Number two, entrepreneurship is not easy. And so if you need, I think Elon Musk said this on a clubhouse meeting, uh, and I just think it's so true. People are like, what words of motivation would you give for a new entrepreneur? If you need motivational quotes or motivational words, then entrepreneurship isn't for you. And I, I tend to agree with him. Like, if you need that motivation, like, it is one of the loneliest paths, period. You know, at least in coworkers, you have other people who are around you. You can, but when you start on your own, you're starting at zero with no one, and basically no one's rooting for you. Like for me, when I left, like no one really supported me. Um, my parents thought I was stupid and that this was a stupid idea. I was throwing my education away, and I was risking everything to go start a gym, right? Which is really not even that good of a return on investment. You know what I mean? But I was so committed to the fact that I was so miserable that I was like, at least I can just live my life doing something that I enjoy. I don't even care if I make money, and that was literally the the mindset that I was able to to quit with. And so, I don't, again, I don't know where you're at, but the first piece of this is understanding short and long-term payoffs. I did not make a significant amount of money for years after I quit my job, right? So I'd say for the first four years, I, I essentially broke even and made less money than I did as a consultant. All right, so like think about that for a second, right? Now there's a lot of mistakes I made too, and you're going to make them as well because none of us is perfect. There's so many skills that you have to, like you have to acquire so many skills to run a business, right? And so you may have a single job right now and you are, you are doing one specific function of one specific sub-department of a business, but in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to understand all of it. Right, in order to be a successful entrepreneur. So you have to understand how to generate demand. You have to generate, understand how to generate leads. You have to understand how to work leads. You have to understand how to sell. You have to understand how to fulfill and deliver and how to manage people, how to communicate, how to relay expectations, how, like, how to recruit, how to hire, how to interview. Like, there's so many things that you have to learn and I don't want that to be overwhelming. I just want to confront you with reality because honestly, if I knew how hard it was going to be when I started my first business, I don't know if I would have done it. I just, I forced myself into a hole and I always like to say this is you'd be surprised what you can accomplish when you have no choice. As, as dark and morbid as, I'm gonna, as what I'm gonna say is and don't get triggered by this, but like the fact that an entire race in our country was enslaved for hundreds of years and was still able to do that every day shows the strength of the human spirit and what is possible when you have no choice. And so I think that to juxtapose what I said about how hard it is, if you can put yourself in a position where you have no choice, you will be successful, right? If you wanna succeed as bad as you can breathe, you will be successful. And so I think that was the situation where I was in where I, was, I, I knew that the alternative to what I was doing was death for me. And so it was just anything is better than this. And honestly, the next you know, year of my life, even after that, was still incredibly hard, but it was different, but it was still incredibly hard. A keystone habit that has served me very well, and it's only been in retrospect explaining it to someone else that I kind of had more clarity on it, which is why I'm sharing it with you. When I have something that I want that I do not have, so I have a desire, which means I've made a contract with myself to be unhappy until I get what I want, right? And so I have this thing that I want externally. And I think I've had enough experience with this to know that simply writing down the goal means nothing. And so I think this is contrary to common belief or practice, which is like people who write down their goals are more likely to succeed. 
Sure. I mean, having a direction is more likely to achieve them than not having a direction. So I'm not going to disagree with that. But here's an interesting statement that um, may hit you, which is that winners and losers have the same goals, right? Everybody in Olympics has the same goal. Everybody who's in business has the same goal, right? They want to increase how much money they're making, you sell more products, get more customers, et cetera. So the goals are actually not that unique. And so the fact that we're writing them down, sure, it's a first step because we have to have a direction in terms of what are we trying to accomplish, sure. But I think that what you'll see that is different because if you look at two people with the same goals and one person achieves them and the other person hasn't, then it can't be having the goal that is the main driver of success, right? Right. And so then you get, you know, you dive a step underneath that and you look at what are the behaviors that created that goal? And now we get much closer to the things that are actually driving the progress. What gets more interesting, at least to me, is if we know the activities that are going to generate the result we want. So maybe it's we want to get more customers, which means we need to advertise more. And I use advertise by the definition of what the word actually means, which is to make known. And so if we do activities that make our products and services known, like doing more private communications, which would be one on one reach outs, one on one cold calls, one on one DMs, one on one emails, et cetera, prospecting, or one to many, so public communication, which would be uh, you know broadcasting across different <laughs> platforms for media, right? So you have radio, you could have an email list, you could have, um, actually, that would be an example of uh, a high version of scale of the original. So I apologize there, but like making posts on social media, things that are public forum where people can find out about it, right? If you do more of those things, more people find out. And that would be the activity that's associated with getting more customers, right? But the thing is, is that people will know what that activity is, right? They will know that inherently they should be doing more of it. And yet they don't. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 50 more amazing rules from Gary V, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. For me, happiness is being able to do what you want to do at all times. So not conforming, like not pandering, yeah. Just being able to do what you want to do. Sure. I mean, who, who wouldn't want that? And I think 